All right, howdy everyone. Good day, good week, good new unit. Um, it's Halloween today, and I get to record two videos for us all. Um, the first one's by Burke, and then the second one's by Lakoff. And uh, we have entered our fourth unit of this semester, four out of five. So we are now in the latter half of this semester. And um, the, the, the title, the heading for this unit is Informal and Implicit Persuasion. Um, so again, we're moving into considering aspects of social life that might seem innocuous, might seem, oh, we wouldn't find persuasion there. That's not persuasive. That doesn't count as persuasion. Uh, we want to be thinking about some fairly difficult to kind of spot sources of influence and, and shaping of perceptions and behaviors and so on. Frankly, this is the part of the semester I'm most excited about. I think all of it's super fascinating, really. But uh, this stuff, t this unit, and then the next unit, I think, are really thrilling and challenging and interesting. Um, and we're going to be starting off today by looking first at the Kenneth Burke essay, Psychology and Form. And um, what to say about this one? Gosh, well, first thing you'll notice at the top there is that this is almost now 100 years ago. So if you think back to the Walter Fisher video um, and the one before that on narration, we were talking about narratives as persuasion. I, I talked about the importance of Kenneth Burke. Kenneth Burke came along and then after Burke, Walter Fisher, and then after Walter Fisher, then the social science kind of interest in narratives kicked off. And um, I mentioned that both of these uh, rhetorical scholars were not mentioned in that one chapter on, on um, narratives. But this is where I think that kind of groundwork comes from, specifically, potentially no other place more significantly than this one essay right here, Psychology and Form, Jing. So if you've never read any Kenneth Burke before, if you don't know much about Burke, there is no more significant figure in terms of rhetorical theory in the 20th century. And I would argue that even in the entire, entire, entire history of rhetoric going back to the ancient world, only one other person is more important, and that's Aristotle. Obviously, Plato's important, but he was no great friend of rhetoric, and he gave us lots of great provocations and asked some really important questions. But it, in terms of generating ideas about rhetoric and what it does and how it works, you got Aristotle, and then you've got Kenneth Burke, in my opinion. Uh, I think Burke is that important in terms of generating new ways of thinking about rhetoric for the kind of the modern 20th century world. Um, and I think that this essay, like I say, in particular, is uh, it's can, it's challenging, but it's super, super important. And the implications of the stuff in here, I think, are enormous. So we start off uh, Psychology Informed by talking about Shakespeare, and he's looking at Hamlet, and there's this incredible observation. This is why Burke was such a brilliant rhetorical critic and analyst of texts, is because he's looking at Shakespeare... And he's, look, he's thinking about the sort of psychology that's happening within the play, but it's not the psychology of the characters. Not, we're not so much interested in like what's going on in Hamlet's mind. Kenneth Burke's brilliant insight is to be thinking about the psychology of the audience, right? The people who are sitting out there on the floor and in the stands who are watching this, this play, right? This text. And how it is that Shakespeare was able to create certain kinds of tensions and excitements and that kind of like that experience that when you go to a, a great movie or a great watching a great story or whatever, and you have these kind of like, oh, and the story is able to kind of move you around and create these incredible kind of moments. Right. And what's really cool about this, uh, this Hamlet um, little sequence is the way that Burke shows you how. Shakespeare was able to introduce this, this question. So Hamlet is waiting for the ghost of his dead father to show up. And the audience, it says right there in the first few lines, as soon as the situation has been made clear, the audience has been consciously or unconsciously, that's important, waiting for the ghost to appear, right? So in the play, you've been, you've been told about Hamlet's dead father and that his ghost is wandering around or whatever. It's been a while since I've read it, but you know that the ghost of, of Hamlet's father is around. And so that right there is this 
sense of expectation of like, when are we going to see the ghost? Are we going to see the ghost? What's it going to be like? And so on. So the audience is already prepared. And so there is that, that element of like expectation of desire, of appetite. We're waiting. We want, we're curious, that kind of thing. Um, and then in this scene, we expect to see the ghost, except Shakespeare takes us on this kind of little detour where Hamlet is talking about his countrymen and they kind of create a situation where the audience like forgets for a moment about Hamlet's father. And that is when Shakespeare delivers the ghost, right? So as Burke says here, the top of the second page, I had to number them manually. So this is 35 at the very top there. All this time we had been waiting for a ghost and it comes at the one moment which was not pointing toward it. The ghost, so assiduously prepared for, is yet a surprise. Now, so the, rhetor the, the rhetorical dimension of that scene is not what's going on between the characters, it's what's going on between the play and the audience. And that's the, that is what Kenneth Burke's interested in. He's interested in the relationship between the audience and the art, right? The play that's being performed on stage or as we're reading it in a book or as we're watching it on a screen. I don't know how popular movies were when he was writing, but obviously movies kind of take over theater and take over like novels and so on as our kind of popular entertainment. But the same insights still apply. It's all about kind of audience expectation. So that's what that first opening example is meant to be showcasing. And then after that example on the second page, right in the middle there, he says, I have gone into this scene at some length. So as I note in the notes here, here they are, um, is number one and two here is that we get this, you know, kind of opening example that can be a little tricky to follow if you're not remembering your Shakespeare very well. But then we get the, the boom, like he just, he just brings the thunder here so hard. In fact, this single paragraph on the bottom of the second page is the single most important paragraph in the whole essay. And all of these important insights are just packed in there. So he says, it illustrates so perfectly the relationship between psychology and form, this, this Hamlet example. Um, and so aptly indicates how the one is to be defined in terms of the other. You've probably never heard of this or thought about this in this way. Again, this is 100 years old. And I think that, you know, this essay has gotten a fair amount of attention from scholars. But I continue to think that, that of Burke's work, and he wrote a lot, and he had a lot of really, really important and influential books and essays and chapters and all that and concepts, I think his ideas about form have still been like not sufficiently unpacked and dealt with and like uh, appreciated. So I think we have some really, really important insights going on right here. So aptly indicates how the one is to be defined in terms of the other, psychology and form. Psychology is something we've been talking about in this class since the beginning, right? How do we understand persuasion? Well, it's what's going on in terms of the, the, the mind, the brain, of the recipient, the consumer, the viewer, or whatever, the audience, generally speaking, okay? So when we're thinking about form, we're thinking about the psychology of the audience, of the viewer, of the consumer, of the passerby, of us as we're living our lives. It's our psychology. Form is how we are able to, well, let's read what he says here. Um, that is the psychology here is not the psychology of the hero. We're not interested in Hamlet's psychology. That's been written about plenty but the psychology of the audience, of the people who are watching Hamlet. And by that distinction, form would be the psychology of the audience or seen from another angle. Form is, here we go, is the creation of an appetite in the mind of the audience and the adequate satisfying of that appetite. So, perfect Burke right there. We get all this kind of hard to, hard to follow kind of examples and page after page, paragraph after paragraph, and then all of a sudden, laser sharp, brilliant statement Form is, say it again, it is the creation of an appetite in the mind of the audience and the adequate satisfying of that appetite. If you take nothing else away from this reading, frankly, even from this unit, that is good enough. That is so important. The creation of an appetite in the mind of an audience and the adequate satisfying of that appetite. Think about what that entails. Think about going to a rock concert. Think about the expectation. Think about the way that you are are carried through this experience in terms of the lights, in terms of the anticipation, in terms of the sounds, in terms of the mood, right? Think about what it takes. Think about a set list. I don't know if anyone follows music, likes live music. What is a set list? Why is a set list important? Why? Because it's all about the flow of the kind of energy and the mood throughout the course of that show. 
And I would argue, and I think Burke would argue, that bands who are putting together a set list are thinking rhetorically, they're thinking persuasively, they're thinking about the eloquence of the act as the experience of the audience. You got a couple of big rock tunes to start off, then you get a little softer, maybe you get real, you get sincere and kind of stripped down, then you got to bring it back up again, maybe you get weird and funky, and then you end off with what? I don't know, whatever, right? But to the extent that the audience leaves and feels satisfied and feels fulfilled and feels that their expectation and their desire have been adequately satisfied, then you have eloquence, Burke would say. Eloquence. That is an eloquent experience and therefore a persuasive experience. If you leave that experience thinking to yourself, I can't wait to go again or I can't wait to go buy the next album or I can't wait to tell someone about this band, that's... That's persuasion, right? And so for the purposes of this class on persuasion and, and reading this seemingly strange essay on form, right? The whole point is, is that form, again, satisfaction or, or uh, desire and satisfaction, expectation and resolution, that is form. Sit down at a meal. You open up the menu. What's first? You got your starters, right? You want to maybe start with a salad to kind of like start light, but get your taste buds going. And then you move into, if you're in Italy, maybe you'll start with some pasta, then you'll move into the meat course or the fish course, and then you'll finish off with whatever. Even a meal has form to it. You sit down at a table and you have all this hunger, you have literal appetite. The meal, to the extent that you leave that table and you feel satisfied, that meal, that experience has been an eloquent one and therefore a persuasive one. If you leave that restaurant and you're saying, I can't wait to go write a review, I can't wait to tell someone about this, then that formal experience has been an eloquent one. All right. Um, just yesterday I was on TikTok. Um, I actually just downloaded the app onto my phone for the first time because I have a grad student who's writing a thesis on TikTok, so I figured I better learn about this platform. And I came across a video, and it could be a copy of another kind of meme type thing, but it cracked me up because, and I'll, I'll see if I can link it under this, uh, this video here. And it was this dude, and it was just like a pair of arms and this block of ice cream, you know, like the ice cream that comes in the like, kind of the square thing. And he like cut off the cardboard and kind of turned it upside down. So you have this kind of mountain of ice cream and you have these two arms and this guy gets this like kind of glass tube kind of thing and he sticks it on top of the ice cream and you can see through the tube and the whole time he's like all right gang get ready this is going to be so great so you have this kind of big just mountain of ice cream clear tube stuck in top and he starts like squeezing chocolate syrup into it. he's like what we're going to do here is we're going to like lift this up it lift up the tube and then all the the syrup's going to come streaming around the ice cream. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be so cool. And well, let's add some sprinkles, some different colored sprinkles. Oh, cool, cool. We got chocolate syrup. Now we're going to add some sprinkles. All right, we're going to do this in one, two, three. So I'm going to count three, two, one. And then we're going to lift up and it's going to be incredible. It's going to be chocolate syrup. Ooh, let's get some strawberry syrup in there. And let's get some, ooh, let's get some blue sprinkles. Okay, you ready? What we're going to do, just one more time, we're going to, we're going to lift up the vase. And then all this is going to come streaming around. It's going to come melting around. The whole thing is going to be so great. It's going to be so incredible. So all we're going to have to do is lift it up. Just add a little bit more sprinkles. Are you annoyed yet? <laughs> I'm annoyed with myself doing that. So you watch this video. It's like a two-minute long video. And that's the video. Is just him getting his audience all ginned up on this like, well, okay, I can't wait. So I'm waiting there and I'm like, this is probably going to be stupid, but I still can't wait to see when he lifts up this vase and all this goo comes streaming out over this ice cream. And the whole point of the video, and I think it was a making fun of some other video, but I don't know the original, but it was still funny because he never does do it. He never lifts it up. He's like, one, two, three, ready? And, and then it cuts off, right? So the whole point of that, and it got me thinking about that for, for Burke is because there is no satisfaction. It's desire with no satisfaction and so not eloquent and not persuasive and sure enough if you go through the comments to this video <laughs> everyone is so angry with the the creator it's like why did you do this why did i watch this you told me seven times to wait you told me 19 times what you were going to do and you never did it and i'm so mad i'm so frustrated why why like people are legitimately pissed off that is failed persuasion <laughs> that is failed eloquence in terms of in terms of formal appeal and I think that's the whole point of it is to kind of make fun of like a video that promises something that it doesn't deliver on or keeps trying to dragging you through the, 
the setup, right? It's like, ready? One, two, three. And at the count of three, a little more sprinkles. Ready? Here we go. You ready? This is going to be so great. Okay, let's just fix this, fix this. And he keeps kind of dragging out. It's brilliant. So for me, that's a great example in sort of the opposite sense of like how formal appeal works and what Burke would call eloquence. Eloquence, again, is the satisfaction of that appetite that has been created. I often think of movie trailers when I think of Burke on form because a movie trailer, you know, it's like a minute, two minutes. Sometimes they're shorter. If they're the teaser trailers, it can be like 30 seconds, right? Think about what a, a, a teaser trailer does. It's even in the title, teaser trailer. You're teasing the audience, right? You're trying to arouse their appetite to go see the movie. So the formal appeal, the formal, the persuasive dimension of a, of a movie trailer is basically to persuade the audience to want to go watch the movie, obviously, right? To the extent that you've created that excitement. You've done the job. You've persuaded it. And to the extent that you have created that sort of satisfaction, satisf I think part of a movie trailer's whole thing is like you can't completely satisfy. you got to leave a little bit lingering. you got to leave a little bit of like, oh, I wonder what happens. Or that looks so cool. And oh my goodness, I can't even imagine, right? So you're creating a certain mood. You're heightening the arousal of the experience of watching that movie. And you got to give a enough of a satisfaction that you're not pissing the audience off like with the ice cream example. But you don't obviously want to like let the audience know who, who dies or like do they get off the island or whatever, right? You got to leave some of that dangling. But that very sense of anticipation is meant to carry over and then the movie itself is meant to actually satisfy that curiosity i think the whole point of a movie trailer is um i have to make this comment about a moose bouche i don't know if you've ever been to a, a fancy you know type restaurant where you have the the prefix menu with all the different courses oftentimes when you sit down they'll bring you out an amuse bouche it's called which is just a tiny little single bite that the chef will send out pretty much right after you sit down. And the whole point of the amuse-bouche is to awaken the appetite and to like, arouse, you know, to sort of like stoke the fires of hunger for the meal. It's a little bit of a just like, mm, that was interesting. That was so good. I can't wait for more kind of idea, right? So these trailers, these appetizers, these amuse-bouches, think about dating, think about flirting, think about relationship stuff, right? How it is that we... We play coy. We reveal a little bit, but we conceal a little bit. We keep things interesting. We keep the suspense going. We, you know what I mean? This is all fair game in terms of what Burke is talking about, about um, form, about eloquence as the... Pers sorry. Form and formal eloquence as persuasion, right? So for Burke, and he'll get to this toward the end, their eloquence is basically satisfaction. If you are satisfied, if you have your expectation satisfied, that is eloquent. And that is therefore, I'm going to add, that is therefore persuasive. Eloquence is satisfaction. If we are satisfied, we are maybe not fully persuaded, but we are in the kind of persuasive, persuaded zone, you know, like we are persuadable, we are amenable, we are open. All right, so the end of that paragraph, again, still on that second page, the bottom. Um, the satisfaction, so complicated is the human mechanism, at times involves a temporary set of frustrations. Again, the ice cream video is nothing but frustrations. When is this goof going to lift up the thing? I don't even care anymore. I just need to see. Who cares about sprinkles? Oh, my goodness, it's so dumb. But is he going to do it? No, he never does it, right? So the frustration is the whole point of that video. In the end, these frustrations uh, prove to be simply a more involved kind of satisfaction. So, again, movie trailer. Maybe there's some frustrations. Wait, who is that? Wait, I thought he was supposed to be dead from the last movie. Wait, what's going on here? I need to go see the movie. And then you get your final satisfaction, hopefully, right? Furthermore, serve to make satisfaction of fulfillment more intense. The word desire comes up a lot in this. Uh, and then look at the very end of that paragraph, that last sentence. While obviously this is also the psychology of the audience, since it involves desires and their appeasements. That's it. Desire, satisfaction. That is form. To the extent that an experience, a text, a, a message, uh, whatever, is able to give us that kind of, of a shape, of a shape of anticipation and then satisfaction, we have experienced form. Very loose and very tight definition of form at the same time. So really, that is the important part of that essay right there. There's only a few other little twists. A lot of examples, but only a few other little idea twists worth mentioning. But that's like the, the key, key stuff there. So if you're good on that, 
then we can begin to think about other forms of form, other ways of thinking about the persuasive function of form itself. I'd be curious to know what you guys might think in terms of like just life experiences, things that we do that have a kind of shape to them, that have a kind of expectation, frustration, frustration, and then satisfaction. Anyone doing the, um, these things have become pretty popular, the like escape rooms, right? I feel like there's a kind of formal process there, the anticipation, the, the expectation of like, maybe there's a bit of fear, maybe there's a bit of like nervousness or anxiety, and you're trying to resolve that, you're trying to get through the end, right? So I would argue that the, the, the better, the more eloquent escape rooms are the one that create that heightened sense of expectation, create all these really interesting frustrations along the way, and then give that sense of like real cool completion and satisfaction at the end. So again, you can think about th this, this idea, this concept of form in so many different ways, in so many different aspects of life. Um, it's not just about art. He's using art as his kind of main example. And he uses music as the, like, the most privileged example of formal appeal. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but really, these insights apply to just sort of life in general. Because he's talking about, and when he's talking about the psychology of the audience... And he basically says that that psychology is, I, I was thinking about Wilbert a lot again. Wilbert, you know, this idea of the neuromuscular, right? So psychology is not just this immaterial abstract brain thing that's happening in some other realm. Psychology is connected to bodies, right? So again, Wilbert, every thought we have is accompanied by some kind of neuromuscular activity, Burke is very similar. When Burke's talking about psychology, he's not only talking about the mind, he's talking about the body. If you're in my rhetorical tradition class, when we get to Burke, we read an essay called The Definition of Man, one of his most famous, popular, brilliant essays. And in there, he talks about man as the symbol using and misusing animal. So Burke was very interested in the animality of our human existence, not just our symbolicity, which is presumed to think, you know, to be happening up here kind of like in the cloud kind of idea. No, no, it's connected to bodies. And so for Burke, when he's talking about appetite, he's also talking about desire. He's talking about kind of like physical appetite, right? There's so many different aspects of desire that cut across whether we're talking about books and expectations within books, but also when we're going to like a movie, we're watching the movie, but we're also thinking about the popcorn and the sodas and like, the you know, you got to have the salt and then you got to have the sugar. There's a shape to that even, right? So there's different ways that you can think about this business of desire and of appetite. What other realms does appetite and desire pertain to? Well, Wilbert says basically every realm of life. There is that sense of desire that's driving, that sense of wish, that sense of curiosity, that sense of um, uncertainty and mystery and maybe even a little bit of nervousness, right? But to the extent that we're going through these kind of expectation fulfillment sort of chapters, uh, we are participating in, in this business of form and eloquence. All right, cool. Um, so he gets into this uh, number four and five around there on the, on the notes there. He gets into this kind of science versus art thing. We already covered this a fair bit with the, the narrative stuff. This idea that like the modern period, going back to Descartes and, and Ramus and so on, uh, science and logos and facts were thought to be like most important. And then the aesthetic stuff, the pathos and ethos type stuff, that gets kind of set off to the side. And it's thought not to be persuasive. It's thought not to be like important kind of public stuff. It's just, you know, it's private. It's leisurely. It's less important. Then along comes Burke in the 20s, in the 1920s, basically saying, nope, wrong. Science is still uh, infused with these same dynamics of persuasion. Why? Because as we saw with the, the Walter Fisher stuff and the narrative stuff, even scientists, when they're writing papers, are interested in gaining assent. They're interested. They, they have to justify. There's all of this kind of audience-related stuff that's going on that makes what they're doing rhetorical and therefore um, an aspect of persuasion, right? So Burke's doing that can, kind of song and dance here, basically saying like this distinction between science over here and aesthetics over here is kind of goofy and false. Yes, science is more about information, but just because science is more about information and logos doesn't mean that it's not also caught up in the psychology of form, 
right? Because we're dealing with humans. We're always dealing with humans in terms of our discoveries, trying to share our discoveries, trying to justify our discoveries, trying to like prioritize what we're, you know, all of it, right? Um, so if we're thinking about science and logos and information over there, he would suggest that sort of the furthest distinction that we could make would be with music, right? And so he gets into music a little bit around five, six, seven. Um, and for Burke, music, again, form and information, information, data, you know, just like quantitative data, inputs, inputs, inputs. And then you got form, which is sort of like, you know, the packaging of information, right? Music is the least able to escape that distinction because think about it. Think, I don't know if you, anyone you've ever created music, like forget about the, the words, just creating the sounds themselves. Sounds are just like signals, auditory signals for moods maybe, right? But music is the most deeply psychological of the arts because it's also so visceral, right? Like music carries us, takes us, and again, think about the concerts, live music venues, think about the kind of experience of that. Um, and, uh, and music itself is, is information in terms of notes or chords or whatever, but they're communicated in the form of essentially emotion, right? And the brilliant example he offers is of the lullaby. The lullaby has the kind of a, sh a certain kind of a shape that is almost exclusively connected to the psychology of the audience, the audience being children, babies, right? Da, 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 da. What is the information there? It's hard to know. But the form is all about the desire and the satisfaction and the taking care of the kind of the psychology of the audience there. So a music, a song, as I noted in the notes here, can actually persuade someone to go to sleep. Um, you've probably heard about this before, but... Um, you know, the military uses heavy metal in a kind of opposite way to wake up soldiers and like going into battle and you, you know, that right. So that can like rouse you up. I remember when I used to play sports in high school, um, my wife and I went to uh, a hockey game last night and sure enough, they were playing ACDC's Thunderstruck. And I was like, oh my goodness, I was going back in time. Cause when I was playing basketball in high school, we used to have that song. It's like a 30 plus year old song now. You've been thunderstruck. And I just remember when I was warming up on the, on the court and they were playing that song, I would get so like worked up. I would get so aroused with like, oh, let's go. All right. So music is like formal appeal, like stronger than any other kind of aesthetic or art form. Music is the one that really connects to that audience psychology and that kind of embodied physiology of desire because it carries us and brings us up it brings us down it's so closely connected to mood and how the, the mood of the audience right um yep 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 so toward the end there number nine ten eleven uh toward the end of this essay is where he talks about eloquence and truth right and so for for burke this idea of aesthetic truth is essentially just eloquence the truth of any kind of art is determined by the psychology of the audience and how it resonates with an audience. I think that's just an astonishing insight, right? Which is like whatever is being said within or within or by some piece of art is less important than how it is received and how it resonates and connects with an audience, right? And if you go watch something and it brings you to tears or it has you shouting for joy at the end of it, that is truth as far as Burke's concerned in terms of its ability to connect with and land with an audience. It's not about capital T truth in terms of ideas and propositions and statements about how we live or pronouncements or whatever. No, it's about connecting with viewers, with readers, with passers-by or whatever. So I would love for us to hold on to that insight. I need to wrap things up here. I would love for us to hold on to that insight about satisfaction and beginning with expectation. Expectation, arousal, waking up, right? Leaning in, getting excited, getting sort of agitated, You're like what's going to happen, curious, curious, and then satisfying that or not. Not all art does satisfy, and I'd be curious to think of examples of bad, aside from the ice cream video of like bad eloquence, which fails to satisfy, which fails to give that sense of completion. Um, 
I could go on and on and on about the implications of that, these ideas and give example after example after example because I do see this kind of stuff all over the place. You could probably even see it in terms of architecture and how a home is laid out and the sequence of rooms or go to a museum and how the museum is laid out or even a grocery store and how that's laid out and how the dessert is always at the checkout lane. You know what I mean? Like really fascinating implications in terms of expectation, right? New information, frustration, further further curiosity, and then that final sense of completion. There's so much that we could look at there that I do believe perfectly fits in a class on persuasion because we are persuaded. We are won over when we are satisfied, when we have had our appetites or our curiosity satisfied. We are, we are one with a W. So that's plenty. I will stop there and move on to something that's close but not you know exactly the same, this business of framing. That's Lakoff. So I'll see you there.